Working across 32 African countries, I came to experience how West Africa is significantly different from East Africa, and East Africa is significantly different from South Africa. For example, if you take the weather, West Africa is much more hot because close to the Sahara, followed by East Africa, and then South Africa is the, is the coldest. So actually, you could experience winter in South Africa in Cape Town, whilst that is non-existent up north. So even from the way the natural environment, you can see the differences. West Africa is more Sahara, we're more close to the desert. As you come to East Africa, you see more trees, and as you go down south, it's more vegetation. And the same with the cultural practices and the way people do business. So West Africans are predominantly you know, colonies of the British and the French. We have much more Francophone countries in West Africa than you find in East Africa. Part of this, the East African community, what they call EAC, is much more integrated uh, in that sense. So the ability to be able to do business and to interact among themselves is very strong. And so is ECOWAS, the West African version of the EAC, which is the Economic Commission of West African States. But in the West African states, what happens is that because we have the English-French you know, divide, you see that the way we do business in the English-speaking countries is quite very different from the way the French-speaking countries do business. I think the behaviors are nuanced. So for example, if we take West Africa, Nigeria is a very big market. Nigerians are very aggressive, they hustle, they're very, very outgoing, they're very, they take risks, you know. Um, whilst Ghanaians, we are much more, a bit more reserved. Even though we are firm, we're a bit more reserved than Nigerians. They get more come across more aggressive than us, right? And then when you go to the Francophone countries, they're way more reserved um, than even Ghanaians, right? And then obviously you have some few post-conflict countries in the sub-region, you know, uh, Liberia, Sierra Leone, um, and a few places. So to some extent, that's the point of the West African culture. When you come to East Africa, I think Kenya stands out as the most sort of the leading economy, you know, in Tanzania, it's Uganda. But generally, East Africans are much more reserved. They are more like Ghanaians. Right? The Africa Intercontinental Free Trade Area is the best thing that ever happened since independence. And so if we came together, we have a big market, right? Now, the free, uh, African Intercontinental Free Trade Area, which was created and came into force this year, obviously, it's going to take time for the protocols to be in place. It's going to take time for the trade barriers to go down and all that. But we're on our way. It will take us time because it took many years for the barriers to be created. So it won't go overnight. But the good thing is that there are certain driving factors that I think make this the best thing that ever happened that we should all sort of gear towards. The first is the fact that it creates one big market. Well, whether they like it or not, it's an inevitable phenomenon that's, going to, that's taking place. So certain things are meant to happen in life. And one of them is that Africa is going to be a leading continent. Whether you like it or not, it's something that is meant to happen. It's destiny. Right. So in that sense, I don't think that they can be against it. But I think that it is good for them that there's a common market in Africa because for the first time they can trade with a common um, block across the continent. So the reality is that Africa has always supported these economies with raw materials. What we haven't done is added value to our raw materials. So we are not going to start adding value to these raw materials and therefore we are going to be beneficiaries of the value that we create. And that's how really the world economy works. In 2013, when I started getting into technology investing, which is the framework then, which countries are living the digital economy. And by that, I came up with kind of five metrics. So, you know, the first was around looking for countries that there was a youth population that were creating digital technology, digital innovation um, to solve problems, right? You know, and the second metric was whether there was a pro-innovation policy framework uh, from the government side that was a sp a supporting that agenda. The tech was whether there was a research, academia, industry that was providing the human capital that was needed to drive that agenda. And then the fourth was whether there was a telecom infrastructure that created a competitive space for telecom um, access, uh, i.e. mobile phone connectivity, and whether there was strong tech infrastructure. So one of the things that we looked at in the metrics was whether there was a pro-innovation policy. In other words, was, it, was there a, a conscious effort for the, by the government to create an enabling environment? Right. To some extent, you see pockets of excellence around that. So the first example is in Ghana. The government created what they call the Venture Capital Trust Fund, which was a government fund that started seeding 
venture capital firms like myself. Then in South Africa, the government created something called Section 12J um, within the Financial Act. And that section basically means that when you, are, you take early stage investment risks in a startup, you can write some of it against tax, right, for example. So what the South African government did there enabled a lot of successful South Africans to start investing in early stage companies because they, they figured that they could write some of it against tax. Right. We are currently uh, in discussions with the Ghana government towards a startup act. South Africa is doing the same thing. And in those startup acts, for example, we are asking the government to give some tax breaks to startups, for example. Right. Because as a startup, every little dollar, every CD, every shilling, every couple counts, every naira counts. So if the government can give you a little tax break maybe for the first three years, you can then apply that capital to, you know, growing the business. The real-time analytics depends on company, government, product, you know, so different elements. So for example, one of our companies, we're going to be interviewed Barclay, um, Finances. Uh, we invested in that company because they had built an incredible system for SACOs, which is sort of um, the local informal lending market, right? And they have now formalized that market and now built a platform that collects the data and also analyzes in real time um, the business's performance. So they're able to know that the members of the circle that borrow money from the circle, they're able to know how their businesses perform. So they're able to give them analytics that, hey, um, Adam borrowed money, uh, 100,000 shillings, but her business is not, uh, we've seen the cash flows are not doing that well. So she may not be able to repay the loan today to maybe give her three days. You know, so that's some real time analytics that allow the circles to not get a bit more intuitive. And so when Adam can say, I can't pay the loan, so we already know, we saw that your business wasn't doing well because you're using analytics to sort of look at the data and then make sense of the data because they see your receivables and all that stuff in your inventory. So can tell whether the business is doing well or not. And I think that this is what you're going to see going forward. As more informal businesses come online, you're going to see that there'll be a lot of online tools that are going to be helping these businesses with analytics, with prediction, with um, creating campaigns and how they can engage online to effectively improve their business. There, there are certain sectors that are leading, right? And, uh, you know, naturally we'll say, let me gravitate towards that. But I really believe that you as a young Ghanaian or a young African you should think about what is your skill set? What is the thing that you are good at doing? What are you here to apply yourself to? And then create a path on that. Luckily for me, that's what I did, right? Even though there's, going to, there's a common market, everything's not going to be common. So the reality is that what you're going to see is that this MTN money uh, or MTN Momo, which is also growing from West Africa, right? Um, they're now um, trying to activate Nigeria more. So you're going to see the MTM money is going to now become another big force. You're going to have m uh, I'm sure Globalcom will launch theirs. You're going to see other, other forms of electronic currency. And I think that is a healthy development. That you're going to have different options that people can choose from, which creates a competitive market and, and the best provider of services will win. So to some extent, once I agree with you, that m may have a head start, you know, from East Africa. They are going to have to think about how they go into Southern Africa, for example, right? Um, West Africa, MTN is already kind of leading in that space. There's orange money as well in the Francophone countries. In the Francophone countries, orange is dominant. They have orange money, right? So that's already three big names, right? And I'm sure that you're going to see more emerging.